All right, guys. Uh, welcome back to the podcast. Uh, I'm one of your hosts, David Cromp. And I'm Craig Thomas. Looking forward to this discussion. Yeah, we are, we're today we're going to be talking about difficult airways, kind of a, a, an interesting topic to me and I think to, to most of us. Um, we're going to kind of go through some of the stuff you can do with difficult airways, but I think the best way to do that is going to be to kind of talk about our experiences. Craig and I were chatting the other day, and it turns out both of us have recently had difficult airways, both of them in a cardiac arrest situation. But what we're going to talk about today, you can really apply to anyone, right? So the last uh, difficult intubation I'd had was out of the cardiac arrest, a gentleman on the ground, um, multiple failed attempts at the airway, was able to bag okay without resistance. Um, but like I said, multiple failed attempts, difficulty seeing the cords. Um, so we started talking about different things we can do, right? So naturally, I think everyone's go-to is the MAC-3 um, when you're intubating. Some people like a 4. This gentleman was a you know, probably over six feet tall. And so the first thing I did was I swapped out the blades, put on a bigger blade, um, gave me a bigger view of the throat, right? So we're looking there and um, I seem like I can see the cords and everything's going well, except I can just see the very tip of the epiglottis. So I can kind of see the cords. So we go there. I are, There'd already been multiple attempts with just a straight stylet and a tube. So I went right to bougie. Um, it was tricky because the, again, there's compressions going on. They had the auto pulse running. Um, but I pass the tube and I, I'm like, I oh, don't know, this isn't quite in. So we pull out, we start bagging him up again. Um, and at that point we're like, we need to do stuff to make our view better. So this is a low lit area and we slide the patient probably a foot downward. So we're in better lighting. That was the first thing we did. Um, even though the auto pulse was on, we put a little bit of a kind of towel underneath and propped him up a little to help align the airway better. Um, which was the second thing we did. And then the third thing is uh, the next time that I went back in and started pulling up, I had to ask one of the medic supervisors on scene to apply crike pressure, which if you're not familiar, it's just um, a couple, you know, a couple fingers with very gentle pressure applied to really where the Adam's apple would be on the thyroid uh, cartilage. And you push down and help drop those anterior airways into view. And even with all that, I got a little bit better view of the epiglottis, uh, kind of brief view of the cords. I took the bougie, straightened it, um, slid it through. The medic supervisor was like, I can, you know, she felt him go through, um, buried the bougie down deep and slid the tube over. Uh, first end title was around 30 and he was bagging okay. We heard breast sounds bilaterally. Um, we, uh, you know, had nothing over the stomach. And so I stepped away and we continued to bag and probably three to five minutes later, end title dropped down to zero. Um, took another look in because that's the first thing you do, right? Is check your tube and we're like, well, I can't really see where it's going because everything is so deep in this gentleman. And uh, eventually, I just kind of made the decision. I was like, you know, I was talking to Craig, and I was like, what would you do in this scenario? And, yeah, I mean, if you're having difficulty, especially in a cardiac arrest situation, uh, an LMA is always a good rescue uh, if you're really having a difficult time with. Uh, intubation and almost everything we learned at the most recent NAEMSP national conference uh, was that LMAs are equally as effective as endotracheal intubation for cardiac arrests specifically. Um, so if you feel like you're having a um, difficult time getting the airway specifically in a cardiac arrest situation, uh, an LMA is appropriate uh, to continue on in your arrest efforts. I mean, ultimately, even if it's not an arrest situation, and LMA is always going to be your backup. Yeah. Um, and that's, airway. yeah, that's exactly what we did. We swapped out for the LMA and his, you know, end title at that point was in the 60s or 70s. Um, so keep in mind, LMA is a great backup. You can, you know, if you get pulses back, that's great. You've got a way to oxygenate them. Um, when they get to wherever they're going with pulses, they can always swap out under better conditions, right? Even though we had done everything we can to maximize this it's still not the same as intubating in a brightly lit trauma bay with um, a glide scope at the ready and, you know, paralytics and every, everything else, all the other resources the hospital has. So I was all about it. Um, and Craig, you said you had a story, right? I did. Um, without kind of belaboring the point, because it was very similar to yours, um, I just want to highlight what I think are the most important steps to take in a difficult airway situation. I think first is the making sure you have the appropriate blade size. David talked about he was using a Mac or it was a Mac three that was being used. I generally will start with a Mac four, but if you don't have the appropriate size blade, uh, that is the first thing you want to try to change. The next is position of both the patient and yourself. Uh, so if you're kind of tucked in a bathroom and you feel like you can't 
either get an appropriate position yourself or if the patient uh, is just laying flat, you really want to get something underneath their shoulder blades and their head so you're more in a sniffing position where the head is actually slightly elevated um, so that when you tilt the head back, the, the vocal cords are not going to be extremely anterior, uh, which is usually what's going to happen if the patient is laying flat. Um, and then the next thing is really your bougie. Uh, if you're having difficult time passing with a normal stylet, uh, practicing with your bougie to get the tactile feel of what the vocal cords um, and the trachea feel like uh, is super important if you're only able to visualize a portion of the airway. Um, those are all things that I think make a big, yeah. big difference uh, if you're still going for the endotracheal intubation. And then if you're still unable to, obviously, as we talked about, the LMA uh, is your next move. But I think on top of just kind of uh, what you do in the situation, it's also recognizing when you're going to have a difficult airway, particularly not just in an arrest situation, but when you have somebody who's still alive. Um, and you want to go over some of those things that might indicate that you're going to have difficulty? Oh, yeah. And uh, I mean, I should mention, too, while we're talking about maneuvers we can do before we move on to the difficulty, like prepping for a difficult airway. Um, the medics I was with that day did have suction ready, like immediately, which is a great thing to see because you never want to intubate without suction. Um, you never know what you're going to find. But so again we're in the emergency field we anticipate every airway is going to be a difficult airway but there are a couple of things where you see it and you're like i know that this is going to be rough so, right so patients with beards big long bushy beards tend to be harder to pre-ventilate which is important because it gives you more time to intubate um people with the redundant chins i guess you could say so obesity around the neck hard to innovate if you see any kind of surgical scars around the jaw or the face difficult to intubate um but also paying attention to neck mobility a patient in a cervical collar, harder to intubate. Uh, jaw mobility, if you've got a patient with a very small mouth, expect that you're going to have difficulty fitting a blade into the mouth. You know, sometimes a Mac, sometimes you need a Mac 4, but all you can fit in there is a Mac 3. Um, and so any, anything that shows a sign of obstruction, if you got swelling around the neck, if you see a post-thyroidectomy scar on the neck, expect, expect a, a tough time. Um, yeah, and if you're having yeah. any of those signs, then that's when you really kind of need to be thinking a step ahead as you're going for your airway. Right. Already have your bougie ready, already have your LMA out, have your partners assisting you. And uh, that way, if you know you're going down your algorithm, that you've already kind of thought a couple steps ahead, kind of like a, a grandmaster chess player. So yeah. Uh, if anybody has any additional questions or stories, uh, stories they want to talk about their airways, that's kind of a, a mainstay of EM and EMS care. So we're happy to chat uh, with anybody about that. Thanks for listening, guys.